Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and I'm so glad that we're here today because we have a very special guest who specializes in going international with your business from Canada and beyond. So Kevin Sanderson of Maximizing E-Commerce is here with us today, and I'm so happy to have him on the show. But first, I want to make sure that you guys know how to connect with me and eventually how to connect with Kevin. Um, after the show, you want to go to mommyincome.com slash join with your code word. Remember code word equals no spammers, no craziness, only truly interested people you want to connect with to learn more about selling on Amazon, answering questions, all the stuff you go to international. I know my code word's a little crazy today. Yeah, because we're going international. Um, and as you go international, you're going to have a lot of questions and this is a great place to come and ask other people who've done it, who've been there and done that. So mommy income dot com slash inter uh <laughs> slash join us see i can't even say that i'm so excited about today um mommyincome.com slash join us with the code word international and that's where you can join the facebook group to connect with other people so let's get to our guest kevin sanderson is the host of the widely popular maximizing e-commerce podcast he is a longtime e-commerce expert a father a husband a creator of his course expand into canada welcome kevin sanderson to mommy income Amazon Files podcast. How are you, Kevin? Good. I'm glad to be here. That was quite the intro. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> I love to have special guests like you, so I would just love, love to jump in. So introduce yourself Let's to our it. audience and let us know who you are and about your family. And Sure, sure. So my name is Kevin Sanderson, and I live in uh, Florida, kind of South Florida. So South Florida would be like Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach area. I live like one county north of there. So it's like kind of sort of like rural meets suburban kind of area. Um, and I have been selling as an econ, well, let's, let's do the father thing first. So I'm a father of two and have been, uh, my, my wife is from Michigan and I grew up in Texas. And now we live in Florida now for over 20 years. But basically the gist of it is, is I was climbing that corporate ladder and decided I wanted to do something a little bit different. So to keep it very short, um, I was starting to listen to podcasts and then the company I worked for got bought out by another company and my level in the organization didn't exist. And so as time went on, one day, my boss taps me on the shoulder. Hey, can you come with me to have a meeting in the uh, uh, conference room? Sure, no problem. Go into the conference room. Her boss was there, which was expected. That was no big deal. But across the uh, table was the head of human resources. And I was like, well, this is not normal. <laughs> <laughs> That's never a good sign, is it? <laughs> no, it was not a good sign. So I ended up um, going to work for a friend of mine who had an insurance agency uh, help them basically, you know, recruit insurance agents, do some training and things of that nature where I really kind of got a knack for training and, and helping people um, to create income streams as we were doing in insurance. And I, I kind of started realizing I'm working really hard for someone else's dreams and I was happy for them. But I was like, you know, if I'm going to work this hard, I really want to work hard for my own dreams. So then I started creating an e-commerce business on the side, focusing mostly on Amazon. And so I left my job uh, there about a year and a half ago and um, been doing this ever since selling mostly uh, most of my sales come on Amazon but it comes from Amazon in nine different countries including the US Wow nine different countries this you guys is so exciting to me because I'm very inspired by that because I got to tell you you guys all know this is our first guest talking about international because although I've been asked a few times before I've even attended like a webinar and a seminar even in person about international and it's always just scared me to death but after meeting Kevin and talking about what he does and what he goes through I am no longer a scaredy cat and I am ready to jump into nine different countries wow so where did you start first when it came to international great question so I started in Canada because it just seemed to make the most logical sense. And I've come to learn that is the way to do it is what's easiest for most people to start in Canada. The sales tax runs similar to how it does here, but it's actually simpler um, because it's for most people, it's going to be uh, registering with their federal government. And then there's four provinces that have their own sales tax, but it, I'm not a sales tax professional. So 
take this all with a grain of salt, but the sales tax professionals I have talked to have said for most people, the four provinces that do have their own sales tax, you don't have to worry about that. So really you're just mostly filing once a year in Canada to the federal government. And so it's simple. It's right across the border. Just take some of what you have here, ship it, test it out. And um, everything about it, I just kind of like. And the, the customers think like Americans. So if you're used to Americans, they're very similar over there. There's a statistic that I've yet to find the actual like real number, but estimates are between 75 and 90% of the Canadian population lives within about a hundred miles of the border. Wow. Of the US. That's super interesting. I did not yeah. know that. And I'm pretty close to Canada. Canada's 35 minutes from here. So I've been there many times. Um, and so I shouldn't be that scared to kind of jump into that, but I think it's just all the different things. So what made you decide to shift into international? What were you doing on Amazon that you just, that you just thought I need this extra edge? Yeah. So great question. So basically, you know, as I was getting started and getting launched, I took uh, season's worth of earnings as a high school football official. So, you know, black and white striped shirt, throwing a yellow flag at uh, high school kids and blowing a whistle. And, you know, what I decided to do was, um, you know, to really start ramping it up. And, you know, as you, as we all know, in physical products, there's a cash flow ceiling of, you know, you only have so much cash coming in. And so if you want to create more product. So, you know, I've been focusing more on the private label side of things. It's expensive to start a new private label brand. So I was like, or even new private label SKUs. So I was like, at the time I was like, okay, let's start going wider and see if I could sell it in more places. So I was trying things like eBay and wish at the time I tried getting on Sears, which I don't even know if they're Sears, still talking open. about antique. It sounds so antique, although it's been a few years ago to have Sears. But yeah, you know, expanding into different platforms with the single or some of the pri private label products you have. You were kind of just trying to go, where can I sell this? How many places exactly. can I get visibility for my product? That's absolutely amazing and super, super smart. So while you were doing that, what did you, you ran into thinking, okay, I've done all these other platforms How and they probably weren't performing as well. You know, some of our right. little bit of sales here, a little bit of sales here. So what then the next step was just, let me try international. Yeah. Well, it was, I started to think of it this way. So if I'm selling stuff, let's say on eBay, and I was getting a handful of sales, selling stuff on Wish, and I was getting like maybe a sale a quarter. <laughs> and I was trying these other marketplaces and I was spending all this time trying to like figure out the marketplace because every marketplace has different terms of service. The customer's expectations are different. Everything about how you operate there is different. So you have to spend all this time learning the marketplace. Whereas I came to realize like in... Amazon world, if I understand amazon.com and my products are selling on amazon.com and similar products are selling in Canada, it's not unrealistic to expect about 10 to 15% of my sales in the U S to expect there in Canada, which was more than I was getting in eBay. And really the only difference was it says CAD for Canadian dollars as opposed to USD for us dollars. So I just had to convert it over. And I was like, the because for the most part the terms of service is pretty much the same like how customers think is pretty much the same how the algorithm works is pretty much the same so it's like really just send some inventory in and let amazon handle it from there this just is, like i do here in the states this is so important i want everyone to just really dial into this because i think that the majority of people out there experts and by all means i sell on many many platforms but i also sell many different types of products that i know which product and which platform does well for the products that i'm offering for example on amazon you know i offer certain things and then ebay and other other marketplaces i offer different things. But I love the strategy here of saying, well, Amazon customers are pretty much Amazon customers. The platform might have a slight difference. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel here. Amazon is still Amazon in Canada as it is in Germany, as it is in UK, as you know what I mean? The, the platforms are very, very similar. I'm sure there's some minor differences that you'd have to get used to. But overall, if you know how to do a listing for Amazon, you know how to do a listing for Amazon. You don't have to learn a whole brand new platform in order to bring your products the marketplace. I absolutely love that. Now, when you're shifting into the international, 
you decided to go, hey, let me see if I can have this one product and spread it out worldwide. Um, can you explain, because I know some people are really confused about this, can you explain the difference between, well, why would I sell on Amazon Canada when Canadians can buy from me from the US? What is the benefit to me as a seller if I'm selling in Canada or the UK or somewhere else, rather than them just buying it from me and having it shipped to Canada? Because I ship worldwide, right? So what's the difference there? Great question. So. I think it was Zig Ziglar said, you can have anything you want in life as long as you get enough people what they want. And so there, and think about if you live in Canada and everything you pay for is in Canadian dollars, you can go on amazon.ca and get stuff delivered within two days, just like prime shipping is here. You don't have to worry about duties or importation costs. It's just free shipping. So basically the way it works is if you get your stuff into the warehouse there in Canada, they'll deliver it to customers throughout Canada, just like Amazon does here. So, and then sometimes even in some countries within the, some customer accounts in some countries don't translate as directly to their able to ship because Amazon wants them to buy in their local Amazon. So there's no, foreign transaction or currency exchanges if they're buying on their own. So basically the gist of it is it's a better experience for the customer and therefore the customer is more likely to buy it. So people that have had like where they FBM ship even from uh, their US base of operations and have listings in Canada, oftentimes say they'll even see like 10, 20 X in sales because those customers are so used to prime and not having to pay duties. So hold on a second. Let me get this right. So if I decide to open an Amazon CA, you know, so mm -hmm. in Canada, and I decide to merchant fulfill from my location, because mind you, I'm very close to Canada here. So right. I'm shipping right across the border and I'm shipping right there and it's not that far. It's not going to take them that long to receive it. It's not going to cost me as much as it would from say Texas uh, to ship over to Canada. So, so I could merchant fulfill some of my items on Canada to Canadian customers, and you could see an increase of 10 to 15% on that. I never even considered that. I just figured it would be too much work and too much hassle. Now I'm really- Well, <laughs> no, no, what I'm saying, just to be clear what I'm saying, maybe I, I didn't say it exactly right there, is that basically um, if someone is merchant fulfilling, they're generally gonna see about a 10 to 15 X from having, or to have FBA versus merchant fulfilling from the US. I see. So you're going okay. to get more sales if you have it in the, the well, uh, for warehouse. FBA, for sure. But yes. I was just even, even considering the merchant fulfill. I was thinking that like if it's from Canada to Canada and they don't realize I'm shipping from me, that could stem from the United States, for example, that could still show them as an incentive of this is still in Canadian dollars. There's still an international... Trans, it's a national transaction for them. For me, it would be a little bit different, but they're still seeing it on their end. Anyway, you could merchant fulfill. The challenge with merchant fulfilling is you just got to make sure that the cost of the shipping uh, makes sense relative right. to, and there are some complexities with the duties and things at the border. Yeah. So I like to send it into the warehouse. Yeah. To make sure it's a better experience for everybody. I just tend to I, I'm not a fan of merchant fulfilling anyway. I've been doing it like crazy during these quarantine coronavirus times. And but speaking of that, I want to talk about that because last week when we connected, you said something that I you absolutely have to share here because everyone mm -hmm. needs to hear that. Um, is you were talking about your sales and how, you know, in the beginning when Amazon was kind of shutting down U.S. warehouses and they're only taking essential items and everyone's scrambling, trying to figure out what to change. And you over here like, hey, my international sales are way up. So talk a little bit about that and how the benefit was for you being set up in nine countries when all of a sudden the U.S. faced this crisis. Just talk about that for a second. Yeah, so great question. So every country has reacted a little bit different and how consumers buy is a little bit different. And so there have been changes Amazon has made about inbound shipments and stuff like that pretty much everywhere. But what kind of effect that has had, at least for me and my business, has been drastically um, less of an impact internationally. So I went from international sales represented in total about a 30 to 35% increase on top of my US sales to during the pandemic, the peak of it, there was one 30 day period where it was 76% bump. So I lost a lot of sales in the US because my 
products are quote unquote non-essential. Right. Um, they're essential to me. And I think the people that buy it think they're pretty essential, but I know, right. Can we, we could go on and on about essentials and who gets to decide what's essential. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. But you know, for a variety of reasons, which I'm sure people listening to are familiar with, you know, some products took a hit. Mine definitely took a hit. So it was one of those things I was thinking about. Imagine if I didn't have this, I wouldn't be getting these extra sales where I'm getting pounds and Canadian dollars and euros coming to me when my U S sales are down. So it created basically an insurance policy on my U S sales. And I actually had several days where I would do more sales outside of the U S than I did in the U S. And that was a pretty rare thing to happen prior to all this. This is so important. And I know everyone, if you're tuning in, lean in just a second and just take that in during this, you know, we can never predict global pandemics, right? This was a right. global issue. And so this is, you know, won't be the first time, won't be the last time. We are always facing something, whether it's economy issues, you know, whether it's weather issues, there's been many weather disruptions and disruptions and supply chains, all kinds of things can happen. But this is the essential not all your eggs in one basket kind of thing. Even though they're all in the Amazon basket, they're spread out worldwide. So while one country might take a hit for whatever reason, you're over here like, yeah, but I've got all this other you know, currency coming in. It's just like multiple income streams for within your Amazon business. I mean, you can't get better than that, you guys. So this is just something to really take in. And now I wanna challenge a little bit of that because sure. I know for me and a lot of our audiences, especially if you're just getting started, and you haven't been doing this really long time. The whole international thing scares people. Are the, is the shipping going to be too high? Is the uh, what about the taxes? What about communication? What about the communication barrier? All these different things. Mm -hmm. So, what was one of the biggest challenges you, you had to overcome right in the beginning? Well, some of it was just getting that information of what am I supposed to do. I think a lot of people are very curious, like what do I do? But then, you know, you go on Canada's. Uh, website and it's got instructions, but the instructions aren't, Hey, Amazon sellers, here's your steps. Or even Amazon will have the steps, but like, it's like two paragraphs and it sounds more like a sales pitch, you know? So it's not necessarily like, here's everything you need to do. Or then I go into forums and I get variety of information from people in the Facebook groups. And the problem with Facebook groups and forums is like, you hear people talking or not hear people, you read them talking, you know, their opinions. And some people that are the most opinionated, the most confident, sometimes are not the ones that actually know what they're talking about. <laughs> and so it's finding that reliable information. Um, you know, or sometimes I listen to podcasts and it was like, you know, where would I go to get all these steps? Or like, you know, I've got the what, but sometimes I need a little bit more help with the how. And so it was, I spent a lot of time figuring it all out. Now, granted, once I'm up and running, I didn't have to keep figuring it out. I just, here's more inventory, check PPC every now and then and get disbursements every two weeks, just like I do in the US. Awesome. I know that that it seems to be the MO for everyone these days because we live in the information age and you can literally learn anything from the comfort of your couch at any time, as long as you're listening to the right people. Cause I guarantee there's a YouTube video on it, but that does not mean that that person's an expert. So, you know, um, we appreciate that you did all the legwork to figure that kind of stuff out. So I already told you, I was going to ask you this, but it's just something that like all the rest of us want to know, like, what is the one thing we should never do when we're attempting to move uh, into international? I would seek out guidance from somebody, whether you reach out to me, you reach out to a tax professional, you reach out to someone. Um, so I made a mistake. I'll use Europe as an example. I made a mistake, which actually I was able to fix it in a way that made sense. But if I didn't make that mistake, it would have not been as good which was kind yeah. of a weird thing. It caused more problems maybe. Right. So the gist of it was they have what's called the flat rate scheme. So it's basically, we think scheme and we think of taxes. We think someone's going to jail in the U S there. It just means accounting methodology. So they have flat rate scheme and what they call the standard scheme. And the gist of it is flat rate scheme is much simpler. And if you do it right and you register into the right industry, you can save yourself a lot of money. And the gist of it is, I messed it up how I did it, but they were able to fix it and end up saving money in the long term, which if I 
I would highly recommend, especially in Europe, that you work with a qualified tax professional. Canada is a little easier to DIY because you're doing it once a year. And when you file, it's like six boxes and they're pretty easy to figure out. And worst case scenario, you can always reach out to an accountant if you're not comfortable with it. I think that's always, I mean, people have a hard enough time with their U.S. taxes, let alone international taxes. I think that scares people. But the reality is the benefits outweigh the issues. And there are answers for everything. Just like here, right. there's international tax professionals. Your tax professional, if they can't serve you on an international level, maybe it's time to upgrade. Because at some point, the bigger your business gets, international should be, you know, doesn't have to be for everybody. But it seems like a natural next step as you're growing your brand or you're growing your company or whatever and you want to expand globally, it's a lot easier to do today in today's day and age than it is, you know, years ago when you're filing paperwork and sending it across the, across the pond, right? So that's very encouraging that it's, you know, that there's available people to help you walk, walk you through that. So yeah. And, and I'll just real quick on that note, a lot of people don't realize there's probably more people that can help them, especially in the tax side of things, because you've got sales tax, which is a local thing for that government but then you'll still have to pay Uncle Sam here in the US for your income tax. Your accountant, if you don't have an accountant, you need to find one here, get a CPA to do your taxes. I guarantee, I don't guarantee, I'm pretty sure I'm one of the only, if not the only client, my accountant has that has multi-currencies. He has zero problem figuring it out. It's sixth grade level math to figure out the ratio and currency. So don't think your accountant can't figure it out and it's that's going to be a... Um, a barrier into doing math, it. Maybe you should move on. <laughs> right, exactly. If they can't figure out how to, you know, say, okay, if you got 13,000 Canadian dollars in sales, that represents roughly 10,000 or US dollars in sales and be able to figure that out, you need to find a new accountant. So I will, I'm going to, you know, kind of throw myself under the bus here and be, you know, I was a little bit ignorant at the time, but like really when a few years back when Amazon was really pushing uh, international and to regular customers all the time saying, Hey, we're offering incentives. We want you in Europe. And mm -hmm. I looked into it and checked into it. And I was so um, blown away by the cost of shipping, for example. So I had all this stuff in the U S and Amazon kept sending me these emails and they're saying, send this product. You know, this is a high demand product in the UK, like send this to the UK. But I, what I was realizing was like this one bundle I had that I was going to send there. They wanted me to send a hundred units and the cost was going to be about the cost of my product. And I thought I have to literally charge double for this in the UK in order to get the same profit margin I'm getting here because of all the shipping back and forth. So I think that was one of a big deterrence for me and I'm sure people that are listening. So uh, let's talk about that for just a minute because I think people need a little bit more comfort that something's not going to be so outrageous that they can't afford it. Well, one of the things I would suggest is, and this is again why I recommend starting with Canada because you're not having to get stuff across an ocean, which right now air shipping it's a whole mess because there's fewer planes flying in the sky. So there's less space for things to go on the belly of a plane to be shipped, you know, to, from here to London or wherever. Whereas there's plenty of space for trucks going from here to Canada. So that makes Canada a lot easier. And I'll say this, if you, unfortunately, and this is something you're probably alluding to, um, Amazon doesn't get involved with, things going across the border. So that creates a little bit of uncertainty of like, oh, it's going to be, so you're responsible for figuring out your own shipping. UPS.com, very simple. And this is a mistake I made because I didn't pay attention. But half the time I've noticed in the clients I've helped, there's at the top a promo code. I missed this promo code for probably about a year and a half. It's either easy, E-A-S-Y, or it's fast, F-A-S-T. And you just put that it's not there automatically. You have to put it in the uh, promo code field, which is easy to miss. But if you put in either easy or fast, and this has been working for years, it'll be as much as 40% off. Hello, y'all. You just said yeah. 40%. Thanks, Kevin. Fast or easy in the ups.com promo code field. I'm literally trying that today. As a matter of fact, I sold something on eBay to Japan and I want to try that and see if it saves me. Try 40%. it. I'm gonna. That's exciting. Okay. So 
Amazon is not handling your shipping to your international places. That's mm -hmm. on your own. Is that what my understanding is? Yeah. So if you can imagine like when you create a shipment in Seller Central and they say, all right, we want everything to go to this warehouse in Michigan. Mm -hmm. And so you've got for each box, you've got two labels, you know, one's your FBA label and one is your shipping label. When you do it, let's say from the U S to Canada, you get a FBA label. Now you have to do the shipping label. Now okay. here's what I will say. There's another reason why I think Canada is a better place to start with. People generally speaking are willing to pay more for things in Canada. Anecdotally from what I've noticed in my own experience and talking to people that have lived in Canada at some point, because if you think about Canada, it's large expensive cities like Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal. Those are, those are like living in New York or uh, San Francisco, like that type of expensive. Or they live out in the boondocks because it's a very large country, but it's about the size of California population wise. So if you live in the boonies, you might be an hour away from a general store that has a thousand products. Whereas Amazon, you just push a button and it just arrives to you a couple of days later. So accessibility is what people are paying for. They want exactly. what they want. They want it now. They want it at their door. This is no different from a U.S. customer. They don't want to drive a hundred miles to the nearest wherever to get what they need. They're saying, no, Amazon has this. And for an extra premium, I'm going to have it delivered so that I don't have to leave my rural area to go try to hunt this thing down. Right. And you as the customer get this delivered to you. So now you're willing to pay that premium. So now as the seller, the seller is able to recoup some of that additional cost for getting it across the border. And one of the things that maybe a lot of people don't realize is there are, um, and this is my, I'm not a tax professional, so take a grain of salt and do your own research on what I'm about to say. But I will say this, the way it works in Canada too is their sales tax of what you're going to have to pay them at the end of the year, you subtract out certain things, including the sales tax you pay at the border. So they have their sales tax is called GST. You pay at the border. You subtract that from the GST Amazon collects from customers, as well as Amazon gives you an invoice every month for uh, taxes. You subtract that out as well. So in essence, as long as you're collecting the sales tax, your customers are paying you back for that. Nice. That's a really helpful, you know, process to have there because, you know, and of course, once a year, you don't have to be filing monthly or quarterly in order right. to do all that, you know, keeping, keeping track of it. So how similar is the sales process? When I say that, I'm talking about the interface, the listing process, the, the way that you find to get sales, the way that you ship into FBA. So is there any sort of fundamental difference or is it very similar? It's all very similar. So the, the, the biggest thing that's different is the shipping. So you got to know the shipping is different, but in a lot of cases, if you're using the same SKU, when you create the listing, you're in the same ASIN or UPC, depending on whether or not you have GTIN exceptions. But basically the way it works is when you get stuff across the border and if you're creating the same SKUs, you could oftentimes use the same labels on the products themselves. Um, and when you're shipping things, you know, it's just a matter of getting it there. But once you do that, everything else is pretty much the same, except you likely have less competition because all these little hoops we, we were talking about, once you get through them, everything is pretty much ongoing on autopilot, but it's the, if you're nervous about it, know that your competition is nervous about it. But what's happening is, as we're talking, someone is typing into Amazon.ca a keyword that's like how they find your products, and they're buying your competitors, or they're buying from your competitors, getting the buy box where you would have, but you didn't get the sale because you weren't there. I absolutely like this is this is my challenge. This is me because of having this interview. I'm going to do Canada and I am going to do it, Love it. your way. And I want to do this. Be and here's the reason because back in the day, I'm like, I mean, I'm not as old school as some people, but I've been selling on Amazon for a long time. Like before 
um, like right when FBA like was a thing, like right before FBA was a thing and I was selling things and books. So back in the day when you could literally load up every single thing you were selling, there was no stickers, no FN SKUs to put on anything. You could put it all in one box, ship it off to Amazon and then just like sit back and collect money. I mean, it was super, it was pretty simple. It was like what I call like the Midas touch of Amazon at the time when like no one else was really doing it. And I was selling stuff on eBay and then I was flipping it to Amazon and I could not keep up. I couldn't sell things fast enough. I'm like, what is, what is happening here? It was just revolutionary. And I really think that that's what the international marketplace for Amazon is right now. It's the Midas touch days. It's if you mm -hmm. have a product and bringing it to Canada, all it does is give you an edge. So if you're on page four on amazon.com here in the US, you could literally be on page one in Canada because all of your competition is too scared to do what you're learning how to do right now, which is getting into Canada and eventually other places because they're, they're disregarding it like I have for the past few years. And this is my challenge to do that no more. So y'all mark my words. I'm gonna let you know when I make my first sale on amazon.ca because thanks to Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of those things, you never know what the results are going to look like. So as much as I say 10, 15%, you can't even guarantee that because there's no guarantees. However, with that being said, I just interviewed someone from my podcast who she's doing about 25% of her sales in the U S and she's crushing it. She's doing it really well in the U S. So she's doing about 60 units a day in Canada just by adding it. Someone else I recently was talking to for the entirety of last year, he was looking at about 35% of his sales, an extra bump by selling in Canada. Someone else I know who he was doing about 15% of his US sales, um, he was seeing in Canada because he also was quote unquote non-essential. He was seeing his Canada sales were 50% of his US sales. So none of them would have gotten anything the only thing that would have guaranteed themselves is a zero if they hadn't tried. Exactly. You can't get results if you do nothing. You can't get a yes if you don't ask. You can't get a sale if you don't do the work. And y'all right. know about the, you know, I, I am not a sugar coater here. I am not one of those people that give you fluff and give you like, you know, oh, you can have all your dreams whenever you want. No, you can if you work for it. And, you know, the, a lot of what holds us back, and I'm throwing myself under the bus here, so we're all in this together. I have been avoiding international because of this very reason, because of fear, because of lack of time to put into figuring out all the steps. But thanks to people like Kevin and his, you know, expand into Canada course, like, we don't have to guess anymore. I don't like guessing. I like to just know, just tell me how to follow the yellow brick road so I can get my stuff into Canada. I want to call my accountant and say, so we're at adding international sales. I hope you're ready for that. And other than that, we're just going to, I mean, what is one product, right? If the process is the same and except for, you know, these labels go here, this one goes to Canada, this one goes to, you know, all the warehouses in the U S you know, why, why not try? I mean, what, what's the worst that can happen, right? We actually get an increase in sales. Right. Exactly. Or let, let's say, you know, how I was saying, you know, oftentimes you can, you know, increase the price. Let's just say for that particular product, the market doesn't seem to be bearing that or the cost is expensive and you're not recouping enough of the price and your margins are lower. You don't take margins to the bank. You take money to the bank. So either way, you're bringing additional money. And this is during a time period that you would not have gotten those sales. So over the course of a month, a year, whatever, every dollar you're bringing in is incremental and extra. And these are customers that are not cannibalizing like one marketplace over the other where they're searching for the best price. They're pretty much exclusive to one country or the other. I have a quick question about research. So, sure. um, the, I guess I know we, we push a lot of product research here at mommy income and the Amazon files and research is absolutely everything. Do you find the research tools are helping internationally? Is, is it the same type of platform to use? Um, for example, you know, people use things like helium 10 jungle scout merchant words. Those are some of our favorites that we use sure. here. Um, you know, I know that on, at least on merchant words, you can search by actual marketplace. So I can literally cut out everything except for Canada, cut out everything except for US, mm. whatever, to do a, a search. Is that still a possibility? Do you find that um, the, the keywords are changing there or is it pretty much the same if you're using the listing here at Amazon, you could just clone it and make it on, on Canada or was it an extra step of research for an international marketplace? 
Great question. So what I would say is, as far as, you know, the first part of the research is check to see if similar products to yours are selling, or if you're doing wholesale, you could see if that product is already there. But oftentimes, even with wholesale, the full catalog of a particular brand isn't there. So sometimes you're just creating more, um, more of a, a value proposition to brands by saying, I could offer you not just in the US, but also in Canada. Um, but then also what you want to look is, are similar products selling? And if they are, at least give it a try. And you can look at sales history and things like that. And sometimes the seasonality is different. Like if you're selling fishing lures, chances are during the winter, there's not as many people buying it relative to what the US is, but maybe in the summer, it's really good because everybody just wants to get out of their house there. Um, so that, those are things to consider. And then um, really what it comes down to is, you know, when you're going into the other marketplace and you're deciding, okay, what do I want to call things? To start off with, use the same keywords and everything is what you're using for that product in the US. And then you can adjust it because maybe you would rank better for certain keywords than you would in the US, or maybe you wouldn't do as well with other ones, but you'll never know until you try. But generally speaking, they tend to use very similar words to what we use in the US relative to like UK, where sometimes it's almost a foreign language, some of the words they use. I know, right? Like that we've done the tests before here when we've asked people, and this this varies um, even stateside, right? So, you know, I'll put a picture, an image of something up on my Facebook group and I'll say, what is this? And then a whole bunch of different people come in and they say, this is this, this is this. And a lot of them are the same, but some people will, some people say these oddball things. We discovered this um, when Amy and I, um, talked about this she's from um the she's from the east coast connecticut area that's where she grew up and i'm of course midwest michigan here and she was at my at my place and we were driving and she said oh punch buggy and she like you know punched me in the shoulder i'm like punch buggy I was like, that is a slug bug, my dear. And she's like, oh, right. no, that's a punch buggy. I'm like, no, from Michigan, well, I, said, I asked my kids, I'm like, what is that? They're like, slug bug. And I'm like, so it just depends on where you come from. So that was kind of the question there, too, was, was mm -hmm. like doing the research to think, like, if people call these, you know, or like robe versus house coat or, you know, slippers versus house shoes, you know, some sure. people just call things different things. So I think I was just wondering about that when it came to the, the keyword research is if that was something you'd run into based on a language barrier or, you know, things like that. And translation is something that I've feared. I thought, I can't, I can't write a listing in German. How am I going to put this in Germany? <laughs> yeah. So the thing I would say, you know, when you get to the point of you're going into Europe, start in the UK because it's also in English, but when you're ready, go to Germany next. And there, it's best to hire a German translator, someone that's legit. Most people wouldn't suggest this. I don't even necessarily, I won't say this is my official suggestion, but I'll say doing this versus not doing anything at all. Start with Google Translate. Yes, it's not going to be optimal. Yes, it's not the best thing you could possibly do. But if you Google Translate your listings into German and sell from your UK stock, which as of now you still can, that's better than not doing it at all. And then maybe if you didn't have the money to invest in a translator, you could look and see, okay, what's selling the best? And maybe those you look into, you know, hiring a, a legit translator to give you translations. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And, you know, I'm all about outsourcing. I can't speak German or French or any other language. Right. Um, and so, because uh, pig Latin, perhaps? <laughs> um, <but laughs> yeah. But seriously, though, like these are things that we can outsource later, but like, you know, focusing on just expanding international in Canada. Well, I've heard you say these many things. And this, this is just reminiscent of when I started on Amazon. It was just like the Wild West. Right now, there's so there's lack of product on Amazon mm -hmm. Canada because people aren't bringing that. So for all of our listeners who we do wholesale bundles here, right? And we do wholesale bundles because wholesale is so saturated. Everyone who's everyone can sell from any catalog that's out there. There's software to just scrape all the information. And of course that means no profits and race to the bottom. And pretty soon you can't even sell anything because fees and this and that. 
but Canada is like the Wild West. Something that does not do well here because you have 412 competitors, you might only have four competitors or zero in Canada. Mm -hmm. So the things that you maybe have tested out, you sold before, they did okay, but then they're not performing well anymore in the U.S. because of competition. This is where you take that item and you ship it to Canada and you see how it does there. What, what have you got to lose? You could send in 10 units and if it, they don't sell and they collect dust, then I guess you could send them back here and you know break even or just donate them. But what do you really have to lose? Because you could actually gain 15 to 20% of an increase in sales because you're dominating the market someplace else. This is just plain good business. And everyone along with me, fear is going away and we're all going to try this. Awesome. Tell us a little bit about your course. You have your Expand to Canada course that you, you've just released recently. And mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about what's included in that and what we can expect if we want to dip our toes into that. Yes. So um, the Expand to Canada course walks you through step by step how to uh, do the process of expanding into Canada. So what, what's happening is before I had the course, I still have it. I have a service where I just do all the work for people. And the challenge for some people is it was just out of their price range. For some people, it made a lot of sense because they were just at that point in their business. But then some people were saying, well, you know, that's outside of my budget. So what I did was I just talked to one of my clients and said, hey, can I use you as a case study? So, you know, blurred out anything that was his products. And what I did was from that point, just, okay, let's take screenshots. Let's do screencast videos and show this is the exact process I'm doing. This is how I'm doing it. So seeing the exact process I use with the clients who are paying me basically to be their project manager, I'm showing people this is how you do it. So I'm walking step by step. So there's no guesswork. There's no going in forums. Which person is conflicting? Which one is actually right? This is based on me having done it for both myself and my own business and in others because, you know, I've even found that, you know, oftentimes when you ask someone at um, Amazon, they know a lot about their subjects, but they may not know the whole picture of what you're going to go through. Awesome. That sounds super exciting. So let me get this right back up because you just tickled my ears when you said you offer both the course and a done for you service. So you, I do. do you still do that? I do. I do. So the done for you service. Um, I'm over here like, where, where do I sign? Yes. That yes. Yeah, so, I'm like, I don't want to learn it. I just want someone else to do it for me and then I will manage it from there. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. So the, the, the service is basically, I just do all the heavy lifting to get you up and running, um, do the registrations that you got to have, you know, get your listings, you know, added on there. So it's basically hand at the end. Okay. Here's everything you need. Now we've got product in. It's basically, I need some information. I need a couple signatures, you know, I need you to ship in the inventory. But other than that, I pretty much handle everything and walk you through every step of the process in the done for you service. Oh man, I'm looking at the, we're going to talk about that after the show. Cause I'm like, I had cool. forgotten that. I remembered that now that you said that I, we, when we talked before that you had this service, but I thought maybe you replaced it with your course because I know, you know, the, the done for you stuff is a lot of work on you, um, especially the handholding, but there are some people like, you know, you have more money than you have time. And so you pay for things like that to where there's people that have more time than they have money. And so the do it yourself option is always the best way to go. So tell us more where we can find this amazing course and any other information where people can start reaching out to you. Cause I have a feeling everyone's gonna be super excited about getting into Canada after this episode. Sure, sure, sure. So one thing people could do if they just want to at least dip their toes in the water and see if, you know, this looks like something they're interested in, you can go to uh, maximizingecommerce.com forward slash Kristen. And um, I'll have a, basically a checklist. I'll walk you through step by step all the things to do. So it'll show you all the what's. Now, if you need a little bit more help with the how and you want to go deeper, you can go to expand to Canada dot com and sign up for the course there but i would suggest starting off at least going and downloading the checklist so again maximizing ecommerce.com forward slash kristen 
Um, yes, and spell Kristen correctly, please. I'm not trying to be mean to people, but it's Kristen T I N K R I S T I N, not E N, Tin, not Ten. Because I always tell people this, and they're like, they always spell it wrong. So, uh, Kristen K R I S T I N, maximizing e commerce. This is your checklist that you're going to get to walk you through the process of the things that you're going to need to do to get yourself started. Now, you could go do all of your research and get your checklist and start there, and that's a great place for those who just have these fears or they have no idea. They never even heard of this. Um, and then where can they go to get the course? Uh, expand to Canada.com. Expand to Canada.com. Well, that's where I'm going first because I am so excited about this. As a matter of fact, I'm looking at some inventory that y'all can't see over there. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, I wonder if my Canadian friends need that stuff. <laughs> like, maybe we should focus on winter things. They're the great white north in Canada. I think I'm north in Michigan, and yet my Canadian friends are surrounding me and they're even farther north. I don't know how they do it, to be honest, but like I have a hard time even here with the weather. It literally, we have record lows today. It's flurries right now. It's record lows. Really? It's, it's May as we're recording It's this. May. This is, I know, I'm sad. Y'all don't even know how much I hate winter. I was just born and raised here and I can't wait to get my getaway. I am moving <laughs> eventually. <laughs> I love my family <laughs> and friends and that's a hard thing to leave behind, but like I will be a snowbird one day and I will live someplace where it's warm for most of like year round. Half here in Michigan is beautiful May through October. After mm -hmm. that, nada. So good. So maximizing ecommerce.com slash Kristen. That's where you're going to get your checklist and expand into Canada.com is where you're going to uh, get expand to Canada. I'm sorry, expand to Canada.com is where you're going to get mm -hmm. the course. Of course, you can find Kevin at maximizing ecommerce.com. That's his podcast, his website, all the great things. Kevin, I so appreciate you coming on the show and taking the time to school us on what we really need to know about expanding in internationally and all that stuff. My fears are put to rest and I am ready to get started. So thank you so much for being part of the Amazon files. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me, Kristen. Great. Everybody stay tuned. Same time, same place next week on the Amazon files. We'll see you then.